kids are never listening to us. They watch us. And so my, um, I, I had a psychology intern that I worked for, um, and he taught me this. Dude, you want your kid to learn how to respect women? This is when I had a son only. I have a son and a daughter now. He's watching how you talk to your wife. He's watching how you take care of the waitress, how you tip the waitress who gave you pretty bad service, but she's the only person managing 45 tables at a busy restaurant. He watches how you open the door for people. He watches how you interact with that woman at church who's really driving you crazy. Um, I have to model what I want this to look like for my son and for my daughter. I have to provide them a picture. I can't just run my mouth at them. I can't hand them a digital babysitter. And the second one is, um, I think it was Sean, uh, Ryan, the other day. that I, I love the way he said this. He said, uh, dude, when you give the, your kids a smartphone, when you give your kids access to the internet, you're not giving them access to the world. You're giving the world access to your kid. Really sorry. Can you give a reverberated I, version I think of what it's, you just said? I think it's the, the government shutting you down. They you don't think in. it's, you're not no, sure? No, I do. You know, I think no it's one a, would think, be surprised. Exactly. Not at this point. That... <laughs> Tulsi and I joked about this, by the way. No, I know I... you did. <laughs> uh, they, uh, yeah, way to go. Yeah, awesome. well, whatever. Anyway, sorry, I apologize. Okay, purpose. Yeah, so you were talking about how children, people, go ahead, give your reverberated portion of what you just stated. Ba basically, you have to, you I asked somebody, um, what do you want on your tombstone? Had a ton of fun or was a great mother, was a great wife, was a great partner? And the response was, I don't really care what's on my tombstone. It doesn't matter. I'll be dead. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I want to have fun. And so, A, for me, I thought that I had a purpose in my life and then I had kids. And it's what I understood purpose to be was radically different. But I also don't want to project on everybody. You have to have a child that purpose. But you have to have some reason to get up that's bigger than you. That's, otherwise, you're psychologically anchored. That's a recipe. That's a that's what our culture is now. It's just an untethered group of people flying all over the place, um, and that did not sit well. Woo, man. Yeah. So, like I was saying, everyone's gonna have a problem with anything you say, and I'll tell you what. Right. That's, and and that's you right. know this because the thing in you will trigger them with the thing in them. It's like that concept of like the purple elephant. Have you ever heard of this one? Yeah, it's like, yeah, if I yeah, say yeah. something and it tickles, it's not mine. Yeah. So the, I, I have a thing with children. It's really interesting. So I have one child and I know you have multiple humans because you just kept on, kept on. on. And I, um, yeah. we had one and we're like, oh, oh, okay. And we're good. We're good. And we're, we're <laughs> solid. What's that? What's that saying? I know your limit play within it. Um, yeah. So I think with children, it's really interesting. You're right on. I think you're really, you know, nail head purpose. I think that anybody who doesn't have a purpose in this life or living for something greater than themselves is always going to struggle because they're not anchored and tethered in. Now, my other thought on this is that if you're having children to create purpose, that's completely wrong. Super, because, right. yeah, disaster, yeah. Well, yeah, because then you, it's the same way people have children to save marriages. It's the same way people have children to give them a reason to get up. It's not a reason. They're, they're not a thing to have. They're a human to bring into your life. And I think that's yeah. where people go wrong is they say, well, I'm supposed to have children. And when we we grow up in this culture of, you know, and depending on where you live, you either there, you know, the schools are teaching your children, climate change, don't have more kids, overpopulation. I experienced this yesterday, which was really interesting. And all of these really negative things about why you shouldn't bring more children into the world. And then you kind of have more of a Southern American view, which is, you have to have children. You have to have big families. That's what creates community. And I do know a lot of people who are pressured into having children because they grew up in a community with a lot of with a lot of families who had a lot of children. And they not only regretted it, but they found out really quickly they weren't cut out to be parents. And I think that it's okay to not have kids and you can still have a life of purpose. But most people I find that don't have children struggle with purpose because they think that their job is their identity. They think that making money is where their life is wrapped around and they miss the greater, the greater experience. I don't think you need to have children to have the greater experience. I just think that you have to care about something or a community or uh, mm, a charity or uh, some other, something else other than yourself. I think when you always anchor it to me, 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 which is what our culture is kind of teaching us right now, you're always going to end up feeling empty. Plus, 
if you take purpose back to, you know, this is a really great example, uh, a community of veterans. If you look at veterans, one of the biggest issues we have is veteran suicide. Well, we don't have issues because people are necessarily struggling with stuff from overseas because I know a lot of guys who've deployed 10, 20 times and they don't have an issue with what overseas looked like. They have an issue when they transition and they lose their identities, then they lose their purpose, then they lose their community. So mm. if we gave people a sense of purpose and community while they're transitioning, I believe we will have less suicides. It's no different than in any other community. If you don't have an anchored purpose, you're just kind of floating off into existence. And that's where you get swallowed into social media. And all of a sudden you think you have this ability to have a nuanced take on Israel and Gaza. And then you just spew it all <laughs> over the internet because you don't actually have a purpose in this life. You just think uh, you do. And you think social media is that. Ah, uh, sorry. There you go. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well done. No, I, 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 yeah, I, again, I continue to find I, I'm new to this, still new. I'm only a couple of years into this whole alternative ecosystem of, mm communicate so i'm still learning but I, I i i just haven't i don't know it's hard i haven't met the 70 year old that says man um after it's all said and done i shouldn't have had kids i haven't met that 70 year old yet i'm sure they exist i haven't met that person yet i've met 70 year olds who regret how they raise their kids how they struggle with addictions i how, if they could go back and do it over they would do it differently but i haven't met the 70 year old who said i should not have done that i right. wish my life would have been better if i'd gone on more ski trips and done less um algebra homework i haven't met that 70 year old i have met a number of 70 80 year olds who dedicated their lives to their careers or dedicated their lives to a thing and now they're staring down the barrel of the last 20 years of their life and they're trying to reconcile, how am I going to do this by myself? Or that that sense of, whoa, I, 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 gave, I gave my life to this job or to this making this other person rich or this other brand big. And then they moved on without me. What's that old saying? It's not an old saying. It's a new saying. Like, hey, if you die on Monday, they will have reposted your job by Friday. Mm -hmm. Like, don't forever forget that. And... Mm -hmm. The people you work with will miss you, but the institution will keep moving right down the road. And I think that's an important thing. Anyway, all I have to say is I, I think that purpose is probably – thank you for letting me process this. Uh, uh, for, for those listening, I, I just walked off my show and had a – it was a mutiny. It was <laughs> awesome. My own team was like, no, 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 call her back. You can't do that. Um, so I'm processing this in real time, so I appreciate that. No, I, I'm glad you are, and thank you for uh, trusting me with the space to do that. It says a lot, but at the end of the day, I think it doesn't – matter what sorry team that's listening i don't think it matters what your team thinks and i don't think it matters what anybody else thinks i think at the end of the day people's opinions of you are none of your business but at if you they're calling you for support the best yeah. that you can do in real time is give them what you truly believe intuitively is the right answer in that moment it's never going to be perfect but right. at least you were there to listen but I do know that sometimes I'm really trying to help somebody and I say it in Spanish and they needed mm. to hear it in Italian. And so I do want to honor my team when they say like, hey, you were trying to say this, <laughs> you whiffed. And I realized I'm having a conversation with a 30-year-old woman whose marriage is falling apart about purpose. And she's asking me about, should I have kids? And so we end up having a conversation. We're using the same words, but we're having two different conversations. And I think that's important for me to continue to learn to be better about meeting the person where they're where they're at and not trying to answer a question that I wasn't asked. So I'm still trying to figure out how to get better at this. Well, it, listen, it, I'm always it's both be and a, it's both and it's yes. And I think you can do it that way. But I think, yes, and you can also be brutally honest and you might have given an answer to somebody that somebody else wouldn't have given. And I think yeah, that sure, can give perspective. And so yeah. you might not have given the answer she wanted in that moment, or that might have been perfect, but it was an answer nonetheless that she probably wasn't going to get from anybody else that was willing to tell her the hard truth. And having, chil and having children to save your marriage ain't going to do it, sweetheart. No, and not having kids. Uh, yeah, it, the whole thing. Um, yeah. yeah. It's there you hard. Go. Yeah. How are anyway, you? I'm good, man. How are you? <laughs> good, 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 good. Yeah, other than our massive crash, me taking other people's advice and not listening to my own. Here we are. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah, Way no, to go. God, that's ruthless, though. Oh, yeah. Trust me. <laughs> it's letting it go. Um, I uh, I sent you a voice message yesterday. I was going for a walk listening to your audiobook again because 
as I stated in said voice message, I read your books first, but then I like to hear them because I think it's a different, uh, obviously reading is one way, hearing is another sense. And I think that when I'm able to hear people's voices, and I think that's why your show is so popular and why you're so good at what you do, regardless of your little slip ups, you are human. <laughs> I think that hearing your voice gives uh, a different context. It gives a different level of emotion and it gives a different depth to what you're saying and it hits differently. So if someone's reading it, they may be reading it in one language, but if they're hearing it, they're hearing it in a different. And so I was listening to that and it seems to always happen when I'm walking along the American border, like I explained to you radically in this text message. Um, I really loved this new book. Uh, I loved your your other book that we discussed last time you were on the show, but this non-anxious life one, I think is, uh, I think you hit it out of the park, especially it's the most timely, timely book I've read in a long time, uh, especially for people who are younger, who are lacking in purpose, lacking in connection, lacking in belief and healing, and they just really don't know how to move forward. So let's talk a little bit about why you decided to write another one other than you're a serial book writer. Um, no, I did not want, I did not want to, I, I really wanted to write a book about, uh, either loneliness or marriage and mm. both of which are just a disaster right now. And I also, I, but I think they've got some, some value to them and the publishing team sat down and they're like, Oh, that's, that's cute, John, but you're going to write about this. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I, I'm kind of done to, I've, been, I've been telling the same analogies for 15 years. I'm done with it. And they said, no. And then come to find out halfway through the book, I had my own breakdown again. And I was, I, I didn't want to write about anxiety because I wasn't living this stuff in my life. And so um, I remember when I finished the draft and hit, I hit send on the final, final draft. Um, my wife told me if not one person buys this book, I got a better husband out of this deal and your kids got a better dad. So it was worth it. So that's cool. Um, but I, I didn't want to go back into this world. Why is that just too much? Too overwhelming? Um, I mean, it's, uh, I love the fact that agency and autonomy are a cornerstone of being well making mm -hmm. choices every day that i want to live a, a fuller life and also that's an exhausting responsibility some days i just want to take off from the gym and some days i want to just choose to do the things that i know are going to cost me psychologically or emotionally or relationally and so it's just a reminder that you can't take days off when it comes to being well and you got to be live an intentional life and intentionality these days is really swimming upstream they want you just to hop in the boat and go wherever they tell you. And that's not going to lead anybody to a, to a good place. Well, I was having that conversation recently, kind of about that intentionality with individuals and just the, the lack of self-awareness or the lack of willing to take responsibility for your own actions. And, you know, awareness is the finish line. And you were kind of talking about that in a different, in a different form, um, uh, in the book and you were, you know, you're talking about once you become aware and, and I'm, I'm a big believer that once you become aware, you, you have a fork in the road and you have to make a decision. And if you ultimately make a decision to not do anything about it, then that's on you. And yeah, I know it's that, it's that matrix scene. It, it was so yeah. prophetic. Like, yeah. Hey, if you take this man, you can't unsee it. And it's, it's like a, Michael Easter who wrote the comfort crisis. He has this group called the 2% group and it is based off of a, of a research study that said at the, at the airport, only 2% of people take the stairs. People will, 98% of people will wait in line all the way just to get the escalator where they can just go right up the stairs. And when he told me that, fast forward oh. two years, two or three years later, I actually left Vegas the other night and my flight left at five o'clock in the morning. It's 3 50 a.m. and I'm half asleep. I, I'm more than half asleep. I'm 80% still asleep because I went to bed at midnight and I come to the freaking stairs and if I had never known that study, if I hadn't met Michael, I would have hopped on that escalator and gone right up. And yet there it is, his voice haunting me. Are you going to be that guy? Are you going to be that guy? Right? You can't unhear that. It just yeah. is forever, man. Yeah, but that's what it is with your audiobooks. That's how I hear you. I hear your uh. your voice in my head when I do things. It's like very, <laughs> it's like very, not only do I like get ghosted by you, but I hear you now. So thanks for that. It's a twofold. But I no take way, pictures. Dude. I take pictures. I do that intentionally. I take pictures of the stairs and I take pictures of the amount of people going down escalators. Every time I'm in an airport and people are like, are you going to stop posting the stairs and the escalator? We get it. What if you have a bag? I said, pick the bag up. Pick the bag up. Pick the bag up. It's not that and, difficult. And here's the thing. If I am somebody who finds myself in a situation where I can't go up those stairs, then i got to choose that hard. Mm -hmm. Right. I like, I, what does that mean that I need to go figure out or what healing do I need to do or who do I need to go talk to or what do I need to do in my life so that I can carry a bag up two flights of stairs? 
I think that's an unpopular conversation to have. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's cruel to continue to let folks say, you know what, not addressing that's probably the best thing for you. It's disempowering. It's, it's, it's dishonest. It's very dishonest. I want to talk a little bit about that. I know this isn't in the notes, but um, we're going rogue. So let's just go into it. Um, I want to talk about the crisis that we're seeing in North America right now. We understand that it comes from people's emotional issues as children with diet and the constant overweight behavior that we're seeing. We're seeing it. <laughs> We're seeing it grow to the point where now the Pediatrics Association is prescribing Ozempic as a solution to the problem. And I, I'm really afraid of that. And it's not to not to come at anybody who's struggling with weight because I grew up in a family where everyone struggled with weight except for me. And so I'm incredibly empathetic toward it, but I am very concerned at the way that we are seeing our schools and our systems tell individuals that it's perfectly okay to be morbidly obese. It's perfectly okay to be unhealthy. And it's perfectly okay to continue down this path because we have a shot that can fix the problem. So how do you address these things with individuals where it's coming from not only a place of compassion and understanding, but also being a little bit hard nosed and saying, we got to do something about this because this behavior is causing the next generation to think that being two or three or 400 pounds is perfectly acceptable behavior. Yeah, I think it's uncoupling self-worth, mm -hmm. right? Like you're intrinsically worthy of being loved, like no matter what. And I'll, I'll fight anybody tooth and nail over that. If you're breathing, you have value. You're worth being loved. And I'm not talking about utilitarian value, some philosophical debate. I'm just talking about like you're my brother and sister. You're like you have value. But love doesn't mean that. I'm never going to say something that's going to make you feel uncomfortable. And I, I think we have – it's it's been a long, steady slog towards um, finding ourselves um, still the same creature that we've been for the last however many gajillions of years and a technologically advanced age that moved on us so fast that we were able to solve for these uncomfortable things like hunger or water scarcity or – in, in inability to communicate all these things we solved overnight and now you and i can you're in another country and you just texted me a minute ago and i said hey i'll be back i mean that's insane that we can do that yeah and um and we used one platform to see each other this is like jetson stuff this is yeah. science fiction a hundred years ago right this wasn't real and now we're just doing it as a matter of as, as just a course of nature um I think we solved for comfort so quickly that we accidentally started pathologizing discomfort and we got so comfortable with everything in our lives that now we get we we consider different ideas or something that challenges us as violence as mm -hmm. discomfort right and so instead of looking at somebody and saying hey I love you enough to tell you like man I I want you I, I want you to not pick a path that's going to end your life 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years prematurely. I want you to feel comfortable and be able to experience joy and laughter and movement. All of these things are coming at the expense of me having a hard conversation saying no, or I've got to change as a parent, the adult in the room. i got to change my behavior, and that's terrifying, right? So I think it's decoupling this idea. Of course you're lovable. Of course, and I can't honestly tell you if – you are metabolically unhealthy that um that you just go do you it's unsafe it's not it's not healthy it's not whole and it's because i love you right and i think that's a host of behaviors i tell my friends who who struggles with alcohol tell my friends who struggle with significant mental health disorders tell a friend who's cheating on his wife hey stop stop right and i love you enough to tell you that right <clears throat> and i think that's the difference between you and maybe the way that i word it uh. and i think that's what <laughs> I think, Fair. That's, I think I think it's the delivery, John. I think I'm I'm starting to discover that. Um, you are known for your compassionate nuance. That is something like <laughs> that's that. The Kelsey way. <laughs> that's the something way. That's for damn sure. Listen, I'm hired for a reason. Exactly. There's, yeah, you and I are both a little different on that because you come at it from a place of. You can feel the empathy on your calls. You can feel the empathy in your show, and that's just how you are as a human being. I remember. Um, if you'll allow me to tell this quick story, I was, I was going through something and I was really struggling and I, I have my therapist. I've had my guy since 2011, old man will answer the phone for me any day, all the time, you name it, the guy's there for me. And I love that. And because I've been able to cultivate 
amazing humans around me, like anybody who's trying to do anything hard, you have to have coaches, you have to have mentors, you have to have these support networks around you, you cannot do this alone. I took a shot in the dark and I sent you a voice message when I was really going through something. And you so quickly, so easily responded with the most common sense perspective. But the point is, is you responded with it. And you took time out of it to talk to me out of a, a place of compassion where that's what I needed in that moment. And I'm really grateful for that. But I, the reason I bring that up is because it feels like you know, throughout the book, the theme is having individuals by you, bringing tacos, you know, just being there, not necessarily saying anything, but just showing up and allowing for that space. So I want to talk a little bit about community because what I'm seeing in North America is the lack of community, the lack of uh, conversation, and more so the individuals that are showing up and saying, you don't need a man, you don't need um, kids, you don't need to be in church, you don't need to be around other people, you can do it alone, you can grind alone. It's that, that kind of mentality that <laughs> I love him. And I think he's great. But that Alex Hermosi has, which is very much like, no, you just got to keep going, got to keep well, no, you need people around you yeah. to support you. That's what human biology dictates. So with the lack of religious structure, the lack of community, it feels like we are losing ourselves more than we ever have. Yeah, we've, uh, I mean, I say it often, we've created the loneliest generation in human history. It's, it's a radical, um, it's, it, I mean, you, we, we've beat this to death. You and I have talked about this privately, but I mean, we had to create a new category of, of death, which is the death of despair. We had, to, we had to reconceptualize new ways we're finding to die. It, it is surrounded by abundance and ex excess. Um, like evolutionarily speaking, it's madness, but we've created this radical, lonely existence and we call it grind it and hustle it and suck it up. And physiologically, our bodies are imploding on themselves. And, um, we've uploaded every relationship to the internet and, and we've digitized everything, even husbands and wives, like, right. And we have made ourselves the radical center of our own universe. And that is collapsing around us. And then you throw some great um, – I, 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 somebody caught me off guard once on a, on a national interview that I wasn't expecting, and my policy is if somebody asks me a question I I've never had before, I don't really see coming, I'll just answer from my guts. And that's – sometimes I got to eat that, but it is what it is. Um, and they ask, they're asking about masks. Like, is, is this uh, a – have we ruined kids? And I said, you know what? Kids are resilient. Kids can figure stuff. They're amazing. Um, I said, what's ruining kids is a generation of lonely, raged out, out of control adults that are completely unregulated. And as I got to think about it, man, overnight in an effort to get a lot of clicks on YouTubes and to be the smartest person in our little circles that we show up in, if we show up in any circle at all, we pulled the string on faith practices. We pulled the string on, on church communities. We tell kids that your teachers are trying to kill you because they made you wear a mask or didn't make you wear a mask. I think all of us, we knew governments are crooked and yada, yada, yada. But I think all of us in the back of our souls believe that at the end of the day, our government's kind of working for, her. they're trying to move the boat forward for everybody. And Even we worse. all, none of, nobody believes that now. Right. Mm -hmm. And so overnight we pulled the string on the government, on education on faith now we're you know what probably the best thing for your marriage is y'all should just hook up with other people uh, have yes. somebody sleep with your wife that'll probably make your marriage better what are we doing right and we're so we're pulling the string on every institution that's kept every culture unified for all of human history and man we are creating little 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 ecosystems little universes of made up of ourselves and um it's all falling apart on us man well, I just wonder why we're supposed to be the most advanced uh, society that has ever been alive and somehow we're the most medicated society. I want to talk a little bit about medication. Um, yeah. You know, you, you're pretty forthcoming and very open about your feelings when you had to use medication uh, for a temporary period of time. I had to use it for, was overprescribed it for a decade and was very much abused because of just my own Un, you know, I didn't understand what was happening. I didn't understand what I was being given. It was just a lack of understanding, but there is no shame in medication. But the issue I am starting to see is I can honestly say that there has not been a human in recent times that I have met that isn't on at least one SSRI. 
So if mm -hmm. we are supposed to be the healthiest generation, the most happy generation, why are we the most medicated generation? I think we've pathologized human existence. I mean, the whole premise of that book is that, you know, I'm making this statistic up, but 99% of the time, if you're anxious, it's your body trying to get your attention. Right. It's, it doesn't mean you're malfunctioning, right? And uh, the number of people I've met with over the years who's like, hey, my dad just left my mom. My granddad just died. My mom is on hospice. I have depression. I'd be like, whoa, you are sad. You are heartbroken. You are um, in deep black hole grief. You just lost a child. Like there's not something wrong with you. And um, we don't have any space for um, a huge swath of normal human existence. And so – or loneliness. Dude, if your body recognizes you're lonely – and it knows, okay, you're responsible for provision, protection, for um, uh, like psychological safety, emotional safety. You are now your own god. Your body would be failing you if it let you sleep or if it let you have a deep, connected, intimate time with your romantic partner. Your body would be failing you. Why? Because it's not time for sex or sleep. It's time to not die, right? And yet… We go to the doctor and we say, hey, I'm not sleeping, and there's no – they got 15 minutes with you before they got to move on. There's no conversation about – tell me about your – why is your body violating one of its core tenets, which is you need six to eight hours of sleep to wake you up at 2 a.m. every night? What is it detecting in your world that makes you not safe, sweetheart? We don't have time for that conversation. We just say, here you go. Take this and get on out of here, and I so – I, I think there's dollars and cents, and I think there is people who desperately don't have a psychology for discomfort, and those have come together with we got a pill for that. We got a pill for that. It was it, I, I think I wrote about that in the beginning of this book. I, it was a yeah. big light bulb moment for me when I was looking at these charts, and it was like, whoa, more people than ever before in human history are medicated right now, ever. More people than ever before under the care of a licensed mental health professional. That's my world. And yet the trend line continues to escalate in a rocket ship type projection. What if we're wrong, right? What if we're, what if this isn't the issue? And that was a scary, that was a scary moment for me because it went against everything I've ever been taught and trained. Well, I hear some doctors, if they're worth their salt right now, they're actually prescribing fitness and outside yeah. time. They're actually well, I mean, having that's, to. I, the literature is saying that, right? Like right. start there, right? Yeah. And um yeah, start. Let's start with exercise. Let's start with fish oil. Let's start with relationships. Sit down with a group of people. Grief demands a witness, as David Kessler says. Say it out loud. What's going on in your life, right? Or put it this way. is something as simple as, and this is controversial. It's, it, I think everything's controversial now. Um, if you owe money to a mortgage company and to a car company and to a student loan company and to a credit card, your body knows – that if you get fired, if you say the wrong thing at work and they walk you out, and these days, who knows what that wrong thing will be? Your body knows that you are one sentence away from being homeless, for having no food, for having no shelter, having no vehicle. It would be failing you if it let you sleep, if it wasn't sounding the alarms all the time, right? And that's just, that's just normal. That's just how we live. And so we've created these environments our bodies can't live in, and then we get pissed at our bodies for trying to keep us safe, right? It's madness. Well, it's madness, but that was such a beautiful segue into where I wanted to get to, but in a way nicer <laughs> way of doing it. It's almost like you know what you're doing, John. Um, so you talk a lot about debt. What I do love about your book that is radically different than the majority of books out there on self-help, debt, consolidation, or just anybody trying to get their shit together is that you actually give resources at the end of every chapter. That is uh, yeah. very different. They're actionable tools. So I want to talk about debt because there's something that I don't know if you've heard me recently screaming about it for the past two years until somebody pays attention. I'm going to keep I doing haven't, it. But go for it. I'll scream it oh, for you. Okay. Well, uh, okay. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> but I'll we'll try. So right now in Canada, um, we were able to stay a bill, but essentially what is happening is there's this organization called Dying with Dignity who's heavily funded. And oh, they have been, dude, what are y'all doing? What are you doing? Oh, it's going to get better. Wait for it. Ready? This goes into debt. So Canada is now got the highest increase of over 30% of killing its citizens for no reasons other than we're trying to save money and we are also trying to depopulate. Um, that's not me saying it. That's statistics, papers, you name it. We can send the resources to you to read it yourself. Where I'm going with this is recently, even though we got the bill stayed to include mental health, somehow 
Canada is still continuing to not only push made, but allow people who are not uh, within their, as they say, within their right mind to make these decisions. Here's an example. It was leaked from Dying with Dignity where they were teaching and educating new doctors that one of the reasons that patients should be allowed to enact made is due to debt. So, Good God. It's a new yeah. bankruptcy. Yeah, so they use the example. So Stacy, Stacy has uh, an injury or an ailment. Stacy has put all of her medical uh, charges onto her credit card. Uh, even though we're supposed to have access to healthcare in Canada, we don't. So she's been putting it all on her credit card and she's been getting help and support other ways. Now Stacy is at a point where she can no longer work and sustain. And now Stacy is living under a mountain of debt. Stacy then by definition with her depressive state due to debt is now a candidate for MAID. And brought to you by Mindful Meds. You guys have been seeing me take Mindful Meds for a little while now. Mindful Meds is a premium supplement company dedicated to supplying humans with the tools to improve their mental health, clarity, and performance, all while supporting their growth along the way. Whether it's the Immunity Blend, Lion's Mane, Inspire, or Voyage, all of their products are clean, tested, consistent, and they've become a huge help in my life. I found Mindful Meds over a year ago now, and I've never looked back. Go check out their website, mindfulmeds.io, and use the code BRASS at checkout. Wow. So I'm not sure. How is this a conversation? I mean, I, I, <laughs> I know. Like, I'm sorry, <laughs> John. No. How is it? I, I get, it's, I, it, it's almost um, like if you sat down with me and I ran a, a, a studio film company, and you're like, hey, I've got a script. This government decides. I know to do this. I would say that's too implausible. You have to make it where it, like I ha it has to be within the realm of possibility um, mm -hmm. for us to get this script through. Otherwise, it has to go to the science fiction department and that's down the hall. Yeah. Right. Twenty twenty one. Yeah. Twenty twenty one. Ten thousand five hundred. Twenty twenty two. Thirteen thousand five hundred. And in twenty twenty three, we don't have the numbers, but it's a bump of over 30 percent in British Columbia alone. So in my world. Mm. If somebody says the words, mm -hmm. I would like to die, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do it this way, and I'm going to do it over here. Right. Um, that announcement is a signal that you are no longer in your right mind to the mm -hmm. point that we can take away your civil rights to prevent you from doing something that you don't have the capacity to um, uh, just to make a choice, uh, make a decision in your right mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Similar to you being like uh, a child, right? Oh, we're doing that. Oh, kids can too? So in the new, uh, okay, so let me back that up real quickly. Um, and let me just le leave it out for you. I had an incredible interview with an individual named Alicia Duncan, okay? Her mother was a psych nurse at these multiple hospitals for 25 years. Okay. Uh, her mother got in a car accident, okay? Hit her head, really bad TBI. Canada, she couldn't see a specialist for 18 months. That's very standard, by the way. That's like the norm right now, 18 months to 24 months to see anybody with a real ailment or issue, cancer doctor, you name it. But a TBI is uh, time is money, right? Well, I know that better than anybody. <laughs> so <laughs> I know that better than anybody. Um, wow. So she couldn't see it. So within two week, uh, two month period, she went from pinning her bed sheets to pureeing her food to them believing that if she left her home, she was going to be shot by a sniper. Okay. So we right. see this kind of pattern going like this and we're not yep. doing anything about it. She then seeks out maid, walks into a hospital, says, I want to kill myself. I'd like to enact maid. They go, okay, well, we got to go through the courts. They do their thing. They go through the doctors, bunch of doctors over the phone, John, assess her and say, she's a candidate for maid. Okay. Daughters find out, daughters go to the courts, say we're going to enact an injunction. It's not safe. She's not in her right mind. Smart thing to do. They do that. They win. She goes home, slits her wrists. Okay. Now, mind you, both hospitals she went to, she was the head for psychiatric care, meaning conflict of interest. There's number one. Number two, it was done over the phone. There's your next problem. Number three, she attempts suicide that week. Two days later, they enacted made on her. Wow. So now what has happened and it got stopped at the beginning, uh, so the end of February, right before the date, it was supposed to change March 17th. And what had happened was we've been lobbying enough where the current administration took the abortion bill last year and slipped in made 
to allow for children with terminally ill down to the age of 12 without uh, with parent consent and then uh, 17 and 18 year olds without parent consent. And then anybody that falls under the category of mental health, depression, hearing loss, traumatic brain injury, or neurodivergent. Now that was supposed to go through. Dying with dignity was the, they were the people pushing this through. By the way, they just have $7 million sitting in the bank all the time for no reason. I don't know where it's coming from. Mm. And they literally got this through to the point where if we didn't stop it, mental illness, depression, hearing loss was going to be in, you were a candidate. You were a candidate for the government to take our taxpayer dollars, walk you into a hospital and between 24 hours and they say, people are like, well, that's not true. Even though we have a blanket of evidence to prove it, 90 days, okay? They don't inform your family. They don't tell anyone around you. They let you make this decision. Why? Because what do we understand, John, about somebody when we want to manipulate and change them? We remove their families. Sounds like a cult, right? We take things away from them so they can't contact anyone to help them. And we tell them and affirm them that there is a prop, that there's no problem. What you're doing is right. And you have the choice. And then Simon's department store used it as an ad to sell their home goods, promoting assisted suicide. So the bill got stopped, but yet we're still hearing of cases of people who had uh, hearing loss, which I am one of those. I'm a candidate for mate, John, in Canada. So I'm not suicidal. I say that on every episode now. And <laughs> you can quite literally walk into a hospital. And if they believe if you have the right doctor, you're a candidate. Mm -hmm. So they are trying to push this forward to the next election to re-vote on it, to include mental health as a uh, option and a right to then take your life. But by definition, is that not an oxymoron? Somebody who wants to die should be able to do that, but... No, it's somebody who wants to die because they're not in their right mind, and we allow the person who admittedly says, I'm not in my right mind, to make a decision. Um, yeah, that's a, tough, that's a tough place to be. Well, here's the worst part about it. We were starting to get phone calls from places in Vancouver with group homes where they were saying they were hearing young adolescents say, this is going to be the new thing to do. Yeah. So groups, we were seeing this social contagion again with other yeah. social contagions that we have seen grow and get loud, yeah. encouraging youth to end their life because it's a better place to be than it is to deal with this life that we have cultivated in this current time. Yeah, it's a tough place to be. That's so a tough, tough, tough place to be. So how do you, because you're the guy for this, <laughs> move you... <laughs> well you have 11 states doing it now too my friend oh well you're coming thank you Don't for worry. your thank you for your leadership kelsey <laughs> listen we do what we can i want to understand how we're supposed to set boundaries when we're talking about this how we're supposed to educate youth and others that their life is worth living john how do we show them that purpose is there if they look for it yeah, I mean, it goes back to the original conversation we were having. How do you tell tell somebody who says, "I don't care what's like, I don't care what's on my tombstone. Who cares about legacy? How dumb is that?" I mean, that was the conversation I was having. Like, right. nobody cares. Um, and here's where I will give because I spent my whole career working with college students and and um, their families. I I gotta give them. I gotta give them a nod. Like mm. us, we haven't set a good example. We've given them twenty years of war. Yep. I've given our 25. I've given them of continuous nonstop. I've given them politicians who scream and yell, have absolutely zero map for the future. The only map is look how much that guy sucks. And their their plan is well, look how much that guy sucks. That's the only map. And so uh, and then the other map is, hey, you're going to be dead in 30 years. You're going to drown because the oceans you're going to you're, you're going to be dead. And I've lived in Texas my whole life until I moved to Nashville. So I have seen an escalation. It's hotter. That's a, that is a thermometer. I can't argue with that. But the idea that, man, when things get messy and hard, we just cash out. That's what happens. We quit. That's, that's the anti, that's an, that, that spirit has changed in my, in my lifetime in North America, in, in America where I grew up. I grew up with a, when things get really hard, that's when we link arms and we go solve some problems. Let's do this. And it has shifted. And so if I'm if I'm 30, if I'm 25, I have no picture of what this looks like, of what doing hard things and seeing a positive outcome looks like. I have no 
map for somebody telling the truth who doesn't get crucified and canceled. I have no map for anything other than you're all going to be dead and it's going to be miserable and awful. I've got no map for every month. It, 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 people are throwing darts at some sort of economic calamity, and it continues to improve and continues to improve and continues to – yes, of course, there's inequality. All that is true, and so I totally get being like, dude, I'm out. This sucks. I'm out, and I can't play video games anymore, and I, there's only so much TikTok I can swipe. I'm out. I That sentiment, I get it's going to to answer your question fully it's going to take a generation of those that are my age that are your age to begin to present a picture that marriage is real hard and it's awesome it sucks and it's amazing mm -hmm. raising kids is the hardest thing in the world and no i can't make the algorithm work on the front end that you're going to have less sleep and less time and less sex and it's still worth it I, I can't make that make sense to a 24 year old. You just got to trust me on this one. Right. And you're going to have to look in the mirror and do a lot of work. Once you see a miniature version of yourself running around and it's awful and scary. <laughs> and dude, when you're holding your hands of your 80 year old dad and you're like, dad, you could have done some things differently, but man, I'm, I'm glad I got to do this ride with you. Um, or you never get to hold your 80 year old hands, dad, uh, the hands of your 80 year old dad. Um, and you go find somebody at your local church to hold her hand or his hand. Like, I can't tell you how that worth math makes sense, but it does. And that's where I have to lean into people who are older than me and who have traveled this thing and who are wiser than me and say, all right, I can't see it, but I trust you. And I don't think we have that model out there right now. And so I, that, that was one of the reasons why I quit my introverted behind closed doors job and said, at least I want to tell my kids I got in the ring and gave it a swing, right? I got in there and tried to say, here's here's a picture of a big, tall, loudmouth, tattooed up Texan who also can say, pull up a chair and this sucks. You just blew your life up, but I still love you and let's figure this thing out. Like I you have to you have to have a group of people provide a different picture. Or somebody like you saying, Whoa, 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 whoa. No, I know what it's like to have hearing loss and have a TBI and have struggle with wanting to still be here. And it's worth it, right? And I'm not gonna let you depopulate us in the name of choice i'm not going to do that i'm not going to participate in that so um sometimes it's compassion and sometimes it's getting on a hill and screaming as loud as you can and beating a drum and sometimes it's like charging forward but man it just has to we, we, we can't keep looking around and going we should just keep doing this it's not working it's not working right it's not working it's not working and it's it's a hard thing to <clears throat> it's a hard thing to explain to little humans who have only ever known stress and anxiety. And we continually, and I say this on an ongoing basis because he was my TV dad. You know, Dr. Phil had it right from the very beginning. Yeah, this man, yeah. He's had it right from the very, we got to stop putting these adult problems on these little minds and expecting that they're going to thrive and do well with it. It's just, right. it's irrational. So with your children, because you have more than one tiny human <laughs> <laughs> running around monopolizing your brain. How do you teach them differently? How do you show up for them differently? How do you be the example in your home? There's two, two big ways. Um, the first way is um, kids are never listening to us. They watch us. And so my, um, I, I had a psychology intern that I worked for, um, and he taught me this, dude, you want your kid to learn how to respect women? This is when I had a son only. I have a son and a daughter now. He's watching how you talk to your wife. He's watching how you take care of the waitress, how you tip the waitress who gave you pretty bad service, but she's the only person managing 45 tables at a busy restaurant. He watches how you open the door for people. He watches how you interact with that woman at church who's really driving you crazy. Um I have to model what I want this to look like for my son and for my daughter. I have to provide them a picture. I can't just run my mouth at them. I can't hand them a digital babysitter. And the second one is, um, I think it was Sean, uh, Ryan the other day that I, I love the way he said this. He said, uh, dude, when you give the, your kids a smartphone, when you give your kids access to the internet, you're not giving them access to the world. You're giving the world access to your kid. And I think that's a haunting but true way to say that. And so my kids don't have smartphones, man. And I just got back their standardized tests and I got back their IQ scores. They're doing pretty freaking great. And my 14-year-old said something the other day that has become increasingly rare among American teenagers, which is, 
dude, I cannot wait one more year till I can get my learner's permit and I get my driver's license and I can get away from you knuckleheads. That's developmentally appropriate for a teenager to want to begin to separate themselves from their parents. Um, and I think that his lack of access to internet and screens and yada, yada, yada. Um, I posted a picture the other day. So we live on some acres outside of Nashville, just in the woods. And um, I posted a picture of a bowl that my wife has when kids come over and we always have kids at the house, always our house is full of middle schoolers all the time and it smells and it's chaotic and it's hilarious. And they're just, they're, they're awesome, but they all know that they just walk in the house and they either don't bring their phone with them or they drop it in a bowl. And you almost, it, it's almost like a, they sprint to drop it in the bowl as like a thank God, right? It's this, mm -hmm. <sighs> And then they head off into the woods or head off to go catch things or go head off to go play in the creek or head off to go make a fire and build a fort or whatever they're doing out there. But it's this sense of oh, palpable relief. Um, I posted that picture on the internet and it was both was super successful when it comes to clicks and likes and positive comments. And whoo, I got some smoke on that deal. Mm -hmm. um, and it just tells us where we're at, that people are so insecure about their kids being away from right um their reach right and i don't know it's madhouse but i i i protect my kids from the outside world um and they're not hermits they go to public schools i mean they're out there out and about and my kid's a great hunter and he hears about some wild things and my daughter's out there with taking care you know i the least of these and yada, yada we take them all, all over the place they see the world but i curate that because i'm their parent i don't mm -hmm. let the outside world curate that so how do you balance that with schools who bring in iPads? Well, one, I'm I'm moving schools at the end of this year. I, I just can't do it anymore. I can't mm. I can't wrap my head around the idea of handing these uh, my third grade, I mean my second grader. She's got a uh they gave her they assigned a laptop to her. Um having met with the tech folks behind closed doors who don't allow their kids access to these tools. Uh, because they understand how they work, and um, I don't know. It reminds it, it, there's an old. It was a conversation about butter and margarine, and there was mm. a. It was they interviewed a bunch of grandmothers, and it was fascinating because the grandmother said, "We all knew. I knew in my guts this when I opened up the top of the lid of country crock. Mm. I knew this wasn't right." Yeah. But they kept telling me this was safer than butter for my kids. And if I gave my kids butter, I was going to kill them. And we knew it was wrong, but we did it anyway. And every time my daughter walks in with a Chromebook or whatever stupid nonsense thing she's got, I feel that in my guts. I know it's wrong. I know it's inaccurate. I know I'm not helping her. I'm hurting her. And so as a parent, at some point, I have to say, I, I, I can't. I can't. And if you're trapped, if you are in a dual-income home, which millions and millions and millions of people find that, and there's only one public school, then you got to go to the board meetings, and you got to skip the football games, and you've got to skip the Little League games, and you gotta you got to show up when you're tired and exhausted, and you got to fight for your kids because it's madness. And at the end of the day, the school boards work for you. The mm -hmm. public schools work for you. Yeah, no, I think that's a great answer. I think that's what most people are facing. And I think that's why I asked you uh, in particular, because the majority of people, at least where I live, in order to live here, you must have two to three incomes. If you don't, you just cannot live here. It's just yeah. that's the harsh reality we're facing. We can't all homeschool our kids. You know, to live in a home around here in British Columbia, you're looking at a two million plus ticket. You're not, yeah. and that's no land at all. Um, right. Or you can do what I did and and scare your son silly with like a John Wick comment the other day when we were talking about moving to the woods and coyotes. And then he <laughs> said, but what do we do about the coyotes? And I said, well, it's only going to take one. And he said, why? And then I didn't catch myself when I went full <laughs> John Wick and said, well, we shoot it, we strap it up to the tree and then the others see that and they don't come around. And my son whipped his head around and went, mommy, you're crazy. And I went, you don't know the half of it. So, <laughs> well, hmm. hey, on behalf of North American mental health practitioners, we thank you for your in advance for your <laughs> your future commitment to keeping us stocked full of patients. <laughs> but but oh, hey, I know. Hey, can I tell you something that yes. I've been wrestling with this? Um, okay, go. And this is very, very unpopular to say. I know this. And so it's still a working theory. So if you get mad at me, get mad at Kelsey. Okay, great. Um, Everyone already does. So welcome. 
I think part of our allergy to discomfort goes against a core premise that we were all given as North Americans, which is you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, wherever you want. Mm -hmm. And that was the, that's what we were told in elementary school. It's what we were told in middle school. It's what we were taught in high school. You are in the land of the free home of the brave. You can do whatever you want, whenever you want, wherever you want. The problem they left out is they left out math in that equation. And so, um, it is very unpopular to look at somebody who is 28 years old, who's 30 years old, and has a graduate degree and is married and wants to have a kid and do the job they want to do in the city they want to do it in. And yet everyone wants to do that in that city, and simple supply and demand says those houses are going to be worth $2 million. And they are worth that because there's that many people that want to pay that. And so I think many of us, I'll use, I'll use North, I mean, I'll use the States. I know people want to, you got a, you got a PhD in literature and you want to be a book editor and you want and that happens in Manhattan. I get that. And that job pays $36,000 a year and that apartment costs $14,000 a month. You can't do it. And so either you can't do that job or you got to do that job in Kansas where it's much cheaper to, to live. I think we have a reckoning coming with. Um, and all throughout human history, big swaths of people moved, and it's expensive, and you can't take all your fancy furniture with you, and it's hard. I get that. 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 And maybe you can't do British Columbia. Maybe to have the life you have. The question I want people to start, a start asking is not what do you want to do and where do you want to live, but I want people to start asking the question, what do you want your home to feel like when you walk in the door? And I think that is a much more instructive use of the word freedom mm -hmm. than chaining yourself, um, for lack of better terms, enslaving yourself to a job and an apartment that you can't afford, a job that's killing you in a location that you don't want to be. Ask yourself, what do you want it to feel like when you walk in the door? <sighs> All right, let's figure that out. And yeah, it might not be a cool place. It might not be a hip place. It might not have cool concerts and yada, yada, yada. But do you have peace? Let's play that game. Well, you talk a lot. You talk a lot about freedom in this book, in the non-anxious life, and I think it is a welcomed change because what it means to be free and what it means to actually have freedom are just very different things. Yeah, freedom doesn't mean I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. Right. Freedom means I refuse to let anybody else tell me what I have to do every single day of my life. And that means I can't owe anybody any money. And that means I got to pick a smaller house. That means, Kelsey, I had two greatest years of my life financially. I wrote two back-to-back -back number one best-selling Wall Street Journal best-selling books. And I've had a, I have a show that's taking off. And I bought a Highlander. A Highlander. You know what those are good for? Groceries and, like, kid carriers. They are not cool Texas mail trucks. And I don't want to over-stereotype anything, but it's not. But I could write a check for that car. And I don't owe anybody anything on it. And it's going to stick around for a long time and it gets great gas mileage, right? So I'm choosing to not be cool because I'm choosing to not be owned by anybody, right? And I think if we wrap our heads around who's telling you what to do with your life and say, I'm going to unhook from that. I'm going to unhook from that. I'm going to unhook from that. Your body goes, whew, you have agency and autonomy. Cool. I don't have to sound the alarms anymore. You're good. It's just a totally different way of looking at life. Yeah, it's perspective shifting. And yeah. I think if, if we're able to look at our lives objectively and stop being so close to them and just pull back a little bit, you can yeah. kind of see where all the faults are. And that's what yeah. I would encourage others to do is to read this book or I, you know what, I would, I would get it to read it and use it as a Bible and an example and a sticky note and a highlighter. And then I encourage people to listen, because I think, again, there is a massive difference when you speak it, John, because you can hear your pain. You can hear where you've had moments where it's applied directly to you or you're talking about your life or you can hear when you're speaking from a psychologist's perspective. And it, mm. it they're just different throughout each chapter. And I, yeah. and I do encourage people to listen to it as well as buy these books because they've been not only useful in my life, but when I listen to them, I don't hear a hypocrite. I don't hear somebody preaching religion at me. I don't hear somebody preaching this way of living that if I say something else, it's just going to blow up the whole uh, ideology. I hear somebody who's a guy, who's a dad, who wants to help people. And he knows how, because he's walked the path before. That's just, yeah, you hear a guy here like, 
is he falling apart too? <laughs> I know, but I'm sorry. That's needed. I'm no, so it's true. tired. It's true. It's I'm true, tired yeah. of listening to people who think they have it all figured out with no life experience at the age of 25, who are social media famous, who put yeah. opinions on things they have no right putting opinions on, who think that they can change the world by yelling Israel or Palestine or Ukraine or Russia or Afghan or freedom, or they don't know what I'm so... I'm so, I'm trying so hard not to curse on this episode, oh, but <laughs> I am say what you want. It's your house. so it's your house. fucking tired of it. And I'm <laughs> yeah. so sick of it because it is those people who have these platforms and there's a lot of them in our community who have mouths that shouldn't be running because they have actual responsibilities to the young people that are listening to their pages. Mm. Enough with the division, enough with saying, if you don't do this, you're wrong. You're going to hell if you believe this. Why can we not find a way to use what these platforms were made for yeah. to actually I, I, be a community? I, it hit me. Um, so going full circle here, writing this book, I, I mean, I, I left my house. I went and checked into a hotel for a week and I, I essentially started over. And it went from a lecture, I'm, I'm, te I'm telling you what you need to do, to me pulling up a stool and being like, hey, whoa, me too. Pass the nachos, me too. And um, one of the things that rang true for me was my granddad is a World War II vet, and I, I, I still don't fully understand what he was doing with code breaking and all that, but it's easy to say. He, my granddad was fighting Nazis, mm -hmm. and he had a picture of the world that was not peace. And then when he came home and everybody exhaled and he went to work, he had a picture of what peace looked like. And whenever things got sideways, he knew it's not that. And I think that we have done such a wild disservice to sanitizing the media, sanitizing the last 25 years of war and what that actually is. And in some ways, lionizing it. Um, the not the actual fighters but lionizing the gruesomeness of it all and hollywoodizing the gruesomeness of it all because um now we have a group of people that think not peace is being disagreed with mm -hmm. not peace is being told held accountable right that's not that's not war that is a discomfort that is a far cry we don't have people who understand what peace even means anymore and they're the ones setting direction for how things roll. And I, I, I like you, I'm, I'm terrified of that because people are afraid of responsibility, yet, man, they want to they wanna throw their chips in the ring. You can't get in the ring and get mad when you get hit. Mm -hmm. And you can't get in the ring and say, I know you can't lecture somebody how to fight if you've never been in one, right? And so figure out ways to bring people together, man. Bring people together. Instead of, I know how to separate us because those people who have been in the rooms where they're not together, see how ugly and gruesome that is. Well, I said, I had that exact conversation on trigonometry. I had the same conversation with Tulsi. We have people that are trying to bring about violence who don't understand what it means to be violent. Mm -hmm. And then we have social justice warriors who think they can get away with it because they're not getting punched in the face. Yeah. And it's a real tragedy to see what's happening. But I am optimistic because we have people like you that have taken themselves out of the shadows, put themselves in the forefront to be the light for the for the people that don't know what light looks like. You know, you're that, I said this on my TED talk that is not being published. Uh, you have to be, the <laughs> <clears throat> I found out, yeah. Yeah, apparently you can't um, talk about 44 suicides a day. It's not, uh, it's not woke. So it's not being published. Wow. Um, so what I will say though, John, that differentiates you from, a ton of individuals who are out there trying to speak through psychology and experience is you are the you are the lighthouse for a lot of people who feel like they're constantly in the dark and you really are the beacon of hope so i hope that you keep doing this show regardless of saying things incorrectly <laughs> or not yeah. saying it the way you wanted to the first time i'm a big believer that your gut reaction as long as you come from here it'll always yeah. be right but when you come from here, it's always going to try to confuse you. So I there think you're you always right, no matter what, when it comes from love. Well, um, you people who listen to your show won't know this, but you're one of the few people that reach out every time I put something out just to be a, a voice of encouragement and a cheerleader and just someone who says, like, I see you and I'm grateful for you. And so I can't tell you how much that means to me because, you know, as well as I do, um, this world that we're entering into, you're <laughs> both very public, but also it's really lonely. And 
man, yeah. it, it means the world to have somebody just be like, I see it and keep getting it. So I'm grateful for you. You're awesome. Well, thanks, man. I'm not going to stop. It's only to get worse. So you're welcome. And um, <laughs> can you please, can you please tell everyone where they can not only buy Non-Anxious Life, where they can buy your other books, where they can listen, how they can support your show, how they can call in and try to trip you up on hard questions. After and only after you're done listening to the Brass and Unity podcast, you can, if you have some spare time, listen to the Dr. John Deloney show. It's anywhere you get podcasts and YouTube, although it may be censored in Canada. I don't know how y'all do that stuff, but potentially, uh, but it's everywhere you can get shows and um, you can buy the book at all the stores. You can go to johndeloney.com or Amazon, wherever you want to get it. Um, and I think that's about it. You can follow me, but but be with your families first. Go get some friends and go do some fun things. Um, and then maybe when you're in the bathroom, then you can scroll real quick. But other than that, go be with your friends and family. So be with your friends and family. That is the best way to end an episode. John, you stick with me. Everyone else, we will see you all next week.